Okay, so let's go. Uh, innovation. Uh, innovation is a good thing. Now that's stating the obvious. It changes the way we live, work and play every day. Now here's what I'm going to do in the next few minutes. I will, I have some slides and I specially kind of curated these for you. Uh, wrote out most of these. And, and I want you to focus on every word that I read out or say here. Um, it's not that I'm dispensing advice from here. In fact, half the things are uh, things that I'm still not sure of. Um, innovation, in innovation we never say that you know it all. In fact, the moment you say that you are an innovation specialist, you are already yesterday. Innovation changes every moment. Uh, so, it changes the way we live, work and play every day. More changed in the last century than in the 10 centuries before that. And look at the way the pace of innovation is going. For more, and far more changed in the last decade than a whole than in a whole century before that. Our definition and access to good life has changed too. Yet, the more we change, the more we stay the same. Now, here's where I would like you to focus your attention. The character of fundamental human fulfillment and happiness hasn't changed at all. Molecular astronomy, iPads, curiosity on Mars, not with seven. Man made means of happiness still compare poorly with the early nature brain ones. If innovation leads to new value, is more innovation better? Is even more even better? Now these are some questions. Or is there? Or is there an elegant app state? When any less is too little and any more too much? Or do, or do we just mindlessly keep innovating? Where do we stop? Where is that elegant middle? What if? What if individuals or collectives had an evolved sense of balance? A sense that would help us dynamically remain anchored to our elegant act. Each one of us has our own elite apt state. Which one is mine? When I ask myself as a person. Which one is ours as an organization? How much do we innovate? Where do we start? Where do we stop? I found a very interesting word uh, called equilibrio, equilibrioception. I couldn't even pronounce it the first time I saw it. Uh, so it's a biology word. It means sense of balance in humans and animals to help them keep from falling over when walking or standing still. So this is one thing, and surely biology explains that it happens because we have this fluid in our inner ears and thanks to our eyes and our, our, our listening, we, we keep ourselves in balance all the time and we walk well and we stand well and we have, we have control uh, in what we're doing. So what if, in, when it comes to innovation, individuals and organizations could have this? Is there a way we could become mindful of our state of imbalance? Could we then trigger a meaningful pursuit of balance? The moment we go off balance, we know we've gone off balance and we then start to come back to the state which is called then intact. Could a framework or maybe a set of parameters help us do that? What would our innovation compass be like is the question. So here are my dilemmas, and here's something that I'm sharing it's very personal uh, with you. And as we say in innovation, you know, innovation is not just about finding answers to your current questions. Innovation is really about discovering new questions, asking questions that we haven't asked yet. So what questions have we not asked about how much to innovate and where? So let's begin with something very, very fundamental to all of us, food, good food. What is good food? You know, it all begins, and I'm going to show you some causal loops here. So just follow the loops, right? What is good food? It all begins with hunger. We have an appetite that we want to fulfill. It all begins with the hunger. And once we are hungry, we seek something. What do we seek? We seek good food. Usually this good food is tasty food. And once we have tasty food, the hunger is satiated. You see this, these loops? The blue arrow means it grows in the same direction. The more the hunger, the more we seek food. And red arrow works in the opposite direction. 
The more we eat, the more we satiate our hunger. So it's a balancing loop. You see a bee right in the middle of the loop. So it's a balancing loop. Now there could be another kind of a balancing loop. Now look at the loop below. We, instead of seeking tasty food, we could be seeking wholesome food. When I say wholesome food, it's, it's balanced. It's got taste, it's got nutrition, it's got satiety. Or everything. So we seek wholesome food and surely that satiates our hunger. So there are two balanced, balancing loops here. Now over time, as we live our lives, something interesting happens. Now look at this, another loop, and that's a reinforcing loop. Over time, and that all of says, you know, there's a delay. Over time, need for sensory stimulation increases. Because as we seek more tasty food, we want more tasty food. And what happens? Normal food feels boring. Junk food becomes the new normal. We don't think twice because we say, okay, let's have this or that. I don't name the brand name together. Yeah, you know. And then there's the place for the wholesome food. There is no place in our life for wholesome food. Unless, of course, if your, doc, your doctor gives you a joint and slaps you and says, uh -huh, another few months. <laughs> and that's something we realize in the futility of all that activity. Now, this is an addiction loop. You know, if you want to decode why people get addicted, and if you, if, if you ask any smoker, he'll give you some amazing data about how smoking is not that bad. About he's maybe saving the world by smoking some of the cigarettes so that others don't get to smoke those. <laughs> Nervous. Lovely food is lovely. I mean, I'm tempted to eat the photographs. I mean, it's so lovely. I'm a foodie. Let me confess that I, I just love food. And I am amazed at these chefs. I think they are magicians. Look at the amazing magic they've created here. Who doesn't want to eat food like that? That looks like this. Fine dining. Amazing, isn't it? And we're very close to lunch. Wow. I mean, who can resist this? I'll tell you. But then when I ask myself this question, if I were, if someone would put a gun to my head and say, man made or nature made, pick one, which one would I pick? Can one really resist this? Can one resist this? Can one resist this? No, I can't. Now these are my personal dilemmas. And when I'm thirsty, I, will, I would want to have that. Apple juice is just amazing. It gives me nutrition. It, it, it quenches my thirst. And also, you know, my sense of good life, it just agrees with that. Now maybe that's good life. You know, I've gone out those days when I was growing up and there would be these sad apples that my father got from the market. Now I have, my fridge is stocked with this amazing array of apple juice that I've loved, chilled, and I pour it into those amazing crystals and I drink. That's good life. What's a good life? I mean, that's a question I've been asking myself the last few years. You know, when I compare this, the amazingness of this apple juice with something else. I'm going to show you another picture. Just imagine you are there. And then tell me what is it that your system responds better to? To this or to that? Yes, my taste buds respond to this very well. But when I imagine myself standing next to a tree like that, when a cool breeze is blowing, and a tree in all its splendor, with those amazing juicy apples, and this tree is offering me this amazing gift of nature. With all generosity and humility. And I accept it with all gratitude and relish this fruit. It's not just my taste buds. My whole system responds very differently. But the sad part is, most of us who live in the urban, the urban living that we are living, a whole lot of us haven't even seen a tree that looks like that. We've only seen these pictures. We don't even know what happiness feels like. For us, happiness is this. <laughs> Sad, isn't it? This is pleasure, for sure. How about this? How about this? How about this? How about this?
Here's a take away for you. Three ways to tell cheap food from honest, wholesome food. How do you tell whether you're eating cheap food a food that's cheating you to believe that the, that the flavor and the nutrition and the satiety that it's offering is authentic and real? And not chemicals pretending to be flavor and nutrition and satiety that it's offering? I'll tell you, there is three rule of thumb, three simple ways to tell cheap food from wholesome food. High decibel advertising. Something that's innately amazing and good doesn't need to be sold. If it is being sold through high decibel advertising, be suspicious. Glitzy packaging. Why are they trying so hard? Why are they trying so hard to sell it to us? <laughs> What's in it for them? And last, Ingredients that grandma can't recognize. <laughs> Some of the food that we eat every day without thinking too much. Just look at the packaging and read the label. Half of the ingredients, one, your grandma wouldn't recognize. Two, they sound like they came out of a chemical lab and not a kitchen. Good life. Now we said good food, let's look at good life. Hunger. Now this time, not appetite as a food. There's a, there's a life fulfillment that we seek, right? And then what do we seek? We seek easy pleasure, exciting experiences. Go for a party, go for that, go to the new restaurant and a new fast food joint, etc. etc. All these are amazing experiences, no one, like I said. It's very difficult to, uh, to resist that kind of food. It's very difficult to resist these kinds of amazing, pleasurable experiences. And that, what does that do? It satiates our hunger for a good life. Or, you could seek happiness instead of seeking pleasure. And surely happiness includes pleasure. Like, you know, healthy, healthy food is not non-tasty food. Happiness is not non-pleasure. It includes pleasure. But it, it includes a whole lot of other things, physical, intellectual, emotional, spiritual, social, and environmental well-being. It's all that. And what does that do? Surely it shapes us. Hunger. These are two balancing groups. Now look at this speed forcing you. Over time, need for sensory stimulation increases. Normal life feels boring. New normal is 24 bar 7 supply of sensory stimulation. Whether it comes through those things that we put into our ears, that keep playing streaming music all the time for us. Or we want, you know, all our senses, we want, we want titillation. Where is the place for happiness? But of course, at the end of our lives, we might look back and realize that that's that we do it. So that's good life. That's addiction. That's an addiction loop too. Modern life science are configured around helping people chase only symptoms of happiness somehow. I don't know why we call it a good life. Are we okay with only symptoms of happiness or real happiness? Do we even know what real happiness feels like if we haven't experienced it ever? Like if, if you've never ever seen that tree which is offering that amazing gift of nature to us, possibilities we haven't even experienced life in all its better. Suddenly, lifetime equals consumption fueled fulfillment. Period. That is sad about it. There's more to life other than consumption, right? How, how, how else can I see or, or, or get fulfillment? Is there a non consumption way of getting fulfillment? So, can I get both? That would be both, so. Consumers marry consumers and produce super consumers. Who in turn marry other super consumers and produce hyper consumers? Love you. <laughs> if the best things in a child's life are things, if the best things in the child's life are things, the humans around him will always be inferior things. Because things don't have headaches. Because things don't have mood swings. Because things switch on when you want to switch them on. And switch off when they want to switch off. It's great to give our children gadgets. Our children become magicians with gadgets. In fact, they are so magical that they can figure out a gadget far before we can. 
But I feel sad sometimes that even before the children have learned to be human beings and human doings and, and have begun to even relate with the human beings around them, they start to relate only with things. And we reinforce this for them. We clap and we say, wow, you just cracked that so quickly. Do you want a super gadget? Thanks to greedy capitalism, we consumers remain self-worth deficient. Self-worth deficient. The system has found ingenious ways to keep us that way and monetize our efficiency. If you feel so complete, why would we seek the products they sell? So they want us to remain self-worth deficient. No, 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 you're not complete unless you buy the new range of bags that we have. Oh, you are still using the old bags? Uh, you're fatty, daddy. <laughs> and, the, and the reason you bought that first bag in the first place was because you didn't want to look fatty, daddy, that you really are. So come buy it. Plan obsolescence. Being taught in management schools and engineering schools. Plan obsolescence. Toxic. When the product is conceived, it is planned by design to get obsolete so that a, that product hole gets created in the consumer's life so that he feels self-worth deficient, so that he runs to the market to fill the hole and then realize, I'm not feeling as fulfilled as I thought I would, maybe I need to get more. And thank you so much, please keep getting more because we keep making money when you do that. Surely, I mean, from the consumeristic world, uh, this guy created things which were so desirable, which are so desirable, right? And this is what he had to say in his biography. And he was talking about his colleagues, Steve Jobs. They bought cars and homes, and their wives got plastic surgery. Really nice people turned into these bizarre people. And I made a promise to myself. I said, I'm not going to let this money ruin my life. Wretched existence, isn't it? When we have to buy self worth through material acquisitions. Buy self worth? Now, if he says good food, good life, then we get good governance. If I'm a business leader, how do I look at governance? Hunger for growth. And I see economic growth, which and which for me is revenue growth and profit growth. And sure, causes satiety and makes me ready for more hunger. Or I can see wholesome growth, which is profits people planet. And that leads to society too. Over time, pressure to get for continuous growth creates disproportionate focus on profits. Normal growth feels tame and wasteful. Megalomaniacal desire to grow. Where is the place for wholesome growth? Addiction. The world has found amazingly creative ways to lend respectability to corporate greed. A whole generation is now growing up, idolizing shadow megalomaniacs. Now, if I were to decode it and really map it for all of us and create a framework around it, it is about being, human being. If being were human existence and becoming, sorry, that G is actually becoming, something's wrong. So that G is becoming. And if becoming is human aspiration, the life really is an eternal journey between being and becoming. It's like infinity. You be, you see a dream that you can't unsee, then you pursue that dream, and then you become, and that's the new being. And then you see a new dream that you can't unsee, then you pursue the extraordinary pursuit again, and then you become, and then you want to be. Being becoming, being becoming, right? And what makes that happen is doing, which is human endeavor. So human existence, human aspiration, what takes you there is human endeavor. So therefore innovation, and here's a new definition of innovation, inspired ingenuity that helps us better our being. Innovation measures parameters. Now let me, let me just quickly run through some of the parameters that the world uses right now as far as innovation is concerned. Impact, uniqueness, sustainability, scalability. Most innovation awards or within organizations, these are the parameters that are looked at. Now, but there's an asterisk there that says 
scope defining only in the limited manner business entities are able to think. Scope of impact is profits. Uniqueness is it unique to, to, to the organization, unique to the world, unique to the industry, unique to the world. Sustainability. Will this innovation outlive the, the founding team and the founding finances? Is that sustainability? Scalability. How quickly will we be able to reach out to the whole market and exploit it? Elegance of emergence. Can a profit obsessed can the profit obsessed man ever match 3.8 billion years of innovation driven by generosity, purity of intent, and magical dexterity? I'm talking about nature. This is the master innovator. I don't think anyone can will ever ever be in nature when it comes to innovation. Let's look at how nature designs its systems and how man designs its systems. Let's look at the differences and maybe man will get inspired by nature. Nature systems are cyclic. Waste of one species becomes the food for others. Man-made systems are mostly linear. Nature systems, power of regeneration is fiercely guarded. Always. No species, no entity is allowed to violate the boundaries. Unless, of course, that species is human to be. But they were not allowed, they just violated. Man made systems. Systems often collapse as a result of over exploitation. We see it all the time, don't we? Subprime happens there, and our national green park collapses one day. Nature made systems. Nature is a very elegant operating system. The interests of, of the system and the individual entities are perfectly aligned. In man-made systems, individual good often conflicts with greater good. Now, nature is a complex adaptive system that is always self-organized and self-organizing. Man-made man -made systems are far less adaptive systems that need external orchestration all the time. They are far more clumsy as compared to that nature systems. Uh, you know, in nature, a balanced play of multiple variables that work towards enhancing the vitality and generativity of the system. In case of man-made man systems, there is a disproportionate focus on one end parameter, that is economic value. Everything else is relegated to means status. Nature is ecocentric. All beings are a part of the web of life that constitutes a network of interdependencies. But in man-made, you know what, uh, a very arrogant self-entitled man, the way we design our systems, we are anthropocentric. Orchestrated by arrogantly self-entitled human beings. So therefore, if you were to be inspired by nature and see if there would be new innovation parameters that we could start using and that would change the way we engage with innovation, what could they be other than the usual impacts, uniqueness, sustainability, and scalability? Now, impacts too, rather than just profits. Can we, can we look at impact as a whole lot of social organizations do? How many lives have we impacted and what's the degree of impact on each life? Can any, do, do, do corporate organizations even think like that? Is the question. Now, how about these four new parameters? Adaptivity, system vitality, balance, and generativity. I think the world needs these parameters. I think we need to make them more objective because the corporate world needs objective parameters to measure themselves. By going beyond distances, human stride can take us. Depths, human nails can take, and heights, human leap can reach. We violate nature's boundaries. That's human scale. Humans are entitled to human scale. Ants are entitled to ant scale. Bacteria is entitled to bacteria scale. When humans decide to use bacteria scale and superhuman scale, that's when we violate. The use, to use without gratitude is abuse. Even that is violation. If we go snatch that apple off the tree, that's abuse, that's violation. The tree is offering it to you with all its generosity. Unless we get accepted with gratitude, we are violated. But that's what we do. For us, everything in the world has huge value. Remember how we used to write that essay on cow when we were little children? Write an essay on cow. Cows are good because they give us milk, because they give us leather, because they give us... Hello? They are good just because they give you something? They are just good, period. Whether you say they are good or not, they are good. 
Who gave you the right to judge what is good and what's bad is the question that innovation people need to ask. Constantly throwing us off balance is Mother Nature's way of keeping our kids meaningfully busy finding balance. Most resources of the world are spent on satisfying needs of those who can only economically afford them, not morally. All those people who can throw money and get those big cars, they can afford them economically, yes. Morally, I'm not sure. If the world's most valuable brands are a reflection of who we've become, by the way, do you know, in every year, every year, this survey happens around the world, the world's most valuable brands. If the world's most valuable brands are a reflection of who we become, we become synthetic, junky, and full of gas. Discovering unfelt, unarticulated, unarticulated needs that are obvious only in hindsight, that's amazing. But manufacturing absurd needs for which your offering is a satisfier, that's an amazing con job. That's what marketing says, right? Go there. Look at unfit needs. Maybe they don't know what they want. Give it to them. If they don't, if they don't know they want it, you need to educate them to live the good life. Hello? <laughs> division of labor led to a, to super specialization. Adam Smith says division of labor. Well, it's good, you know. A butcher is a butcher and a baker is a baker and a... Yeah. So everyone specializes in his own, so it led to super specialization. But now look at where we've reached. It's, it isn't uncommon these days to find perfectly normal human beings who are completely incapable of performing normal human functions like growing and cooking their own food. But have almost superhuman abilities in their area of new age specialization. Say, selling sugar and fizzy water. Well, if that's a person who does that, that's all that he does. If you ask him one day that the mate's not there and there's no electricity, do something, he won't be able to cook food for himself. What a pretty state of being. And he's seeking happiness. Chicken or egg? Giant hunger leads to giant consumption, leads to giant retail, leads to giant production, leads to giant profits. Or is it the other way around? Need for giant profits leads to giant production, which leads to giant retail, which leads to giant marketing, which leads to giant consumption, which leads to giant hunger. Our appetites weren't as big as this, that we needed 20 cars to feel satiated. We actually never needed even a single car. Lucas Law, there's is a, is a very amazing book called Human Scale, in which this, uh, this law says, Other things being equal, territories will be richer when small and independent, when small and independent, than when large and dependent. Who says we need to create a large ecosystem when one country is the factory of the world, another country is the office of the world, and another country is the consumer of the world, and another country is the innovation, innovation of the world? We've made a huge ecosystem, and it's precarious. If something goes wrong, the whole large giant system collapses. Other than that, maybe what we need to look at, look at nature and create a large number of subsystems that together create a web of life. Even if something happens to a small system, nothing much gets damaged. In fact, other subsystems will not let that small system fall by the wayside. That's the web of life we need to create. J.K. Shurabhuti said, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. How are we contributing to it? How far are we from our elegant state? I think each one of us needs to ask this question. I'm asking this question as I speak. Do I have the answers? I don't. But I think I'm just getting to a state where I'm, I'm beginning to become mindful of the fact that I, have, I might have gone off balance already. I might have surpassed my act, elegant act maybe. Do we need to innovate forward or do we need to innovate back? That's not regression. Sometimes less is more. Believe me, it's easier done than said. It's easier done than said. Unless, of course, you don't want it badly enough. Then it's easier said than done.